is with great and genuine pleasure that I introduce my longtime colleague, teacher, and friend, Professor Charlie Catania. Charlie received his PhD in psychology from Harvard University, his MA from Columbia University, his AB from Columbia College, where he graduated with highest honors and with distinction in psychology, and where he was elected to Phi Beta Kappa. And lastly, and in my mind most impressively, his secondary school diploma from the Bronx High School of Science. <laughs> After teaching and serving as chair of the Department of Psychology at the beloved but departed Bronx campus of New York University, Charlie came to UMBC in the fall of 1973. <coughs> Over four decades, Charlie taught the psychology of learning at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. For many years, he team taught the undergraduate learning course with our late colleague, Elliot Shimoff and together they developed a number of computer simulations and other computer exercises for the learning course and for introductory psychology. Charlie has conducted both human and pigeon laboratory research since his days as a graduate student in the early 1960s, with almost continuous research funding from the mid-60s through the late 80s from the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. He hosted visitors from Norway, Brazil, Japan, Spain, and Italy, who came to UMBC just to work in his laboratory. Charlie is a towering figure in the history of behavior analysis, recognized for his enormous range of contributions, both in experimental and applied domains. He is particularly acclaimed for his research in schedules, choice, timing, verbal behavior, and evolutionary biology. Charlie's the author of three of the top 30 most cited articles in the Journal of the Experimental Analysis of Behavior, and he has edited or authored 12 books, including Learning, a major text in behavior analysis. Charlie has published well over 100 research articles and book chapters. He was the editor of the Journal of the Experimental Analysis of Behavior, as well as its review editor and is a fellow of three APA divisions. He has received many prestigious honors, including a James McKean Cattell Sabbatical Award, a Fulbright Senior Research Fellowship, a British Council Fellowship, and the Don Hake Award from APA's Division 25. In collaboration with colleagues at the Kenny Krieger Institute, Charlie established the master's track in applied behavior analysis within human service psychology and served as its director and later co-director through the spring of 2007. The great romantic poet, Lord Byron, once wrote, but words are things, and a small drop of ink falling like dew upon a thought produces that which makes thousands, perhaps millions, think. Charlie Catania's many, many drops of ink have made countless persons think and I am certain that his words will continue to enlighten generations worldwide for many years to come. Please join me in giving Charlie a very warm welcome. instead of a criticism. <laughs> it is so nice to have to be in a place where intellectual curiosity is valued. I've been watching too much of the news lately. Um, so here's the title. Green, red, black, white, pink, blue, and other discriminations. And what my job will be today is to uh, indicate why uh, this is uh, an interesting behavior matter. I'm going to be talking about some basic uh, learning processes that uh, use this language of discrimination, but I'm also going to try to relate it to other important ones. And uh, as you've already seen, maybe we'll even talk about blue-red. After all, I'm retired, 
this is not a classroom uh, setting, so I don't have to feel that as a government employee I can't talk about politics. <laughs> Maybe it'll sneak in along the way. I'm an expert in discrimination. What a hell of a thing to say. And what you saw sneaking up there is, this is my undergraduate transcript. Uh, I wasn't sure about showing this, but I point out to you that here's a course that I took. Uh, this would be probably the spring of 1955, I think it was, or no, the spring of 56. No, okay, I take it back, the fall of 1955. Notice the title of the course. This is Psychology 3. The course is entitled Discrimination, and I got an A in it. I got an A in a course in discrimination. Okay. Now, I was an undergraduate then at Columbia, a long time ago, 1950. Well, I took the course in 1954, which was Introductory Psychology. Uh, the teacher was Fred Keller, who was the author of a book. This is the table of contents of our Introductory Psych textbook. Uh, he and his colleague, uh, Nat Schoenfeld, wrote this book. Uh, it came out in 1950, and in 1954, I walked into that course uh, in the fall semester. It was a laboratory course, uh, and we had rats to work with, and one of the things we did during that course uh, was during the time when we were reading the chapter, which was entitled Generalization and Discrimin Discrimination, we learned how to set up an apparatus in which in a little chamber a rat would learn to press a lever where its lever presses produced food occasionally and if the light was on, its presses occasionally produced food pellets and if the light was off, it didn't get food pellets and eventually the rat learned to press while the light was on but not while the light was off and by doing so it demonstrated that it discriminated between the light being on and the light being off. And you might look at me and say, well, big deal. Because it is, you know, it seems a trivial thing. Sure, you'd expect that a rat should be able to learn something uh, simple uh, along those lines. But it turns out that the topic of discrimination was a fairly substantial uh, topic. In fact, in that subsequent course, Psychology 3, I mean, here's the, here's the heading, it's titled Discrimination, and, and you get a sense here of uh, the lab work. The, we, we did experiments on uh, the human visual system, so we learned about the kinds of discriminations we humans can make as we spend time in the dark and we come, become more and more sensitive to very dim levels of light, uh, so that a, a big part of the course was in fact uh, sensory uh, psychology. We used a textbook that had actually come out in 1938, great big one, about the, I think it was 900 pages long, Woodward's Experimental Psychology. We didn't actually read all of it, though. Uh, uh, but it was a, a fairly intensive course. In fact, if we were to go back to my transcript, and I hope you didn't look at all of it, by the way, because you'd see that by the criteria UMBC has today, I wouldn't have had a prayer of getting into Phi Beta Kappa. So congratulations. You folks are really something special. Uh, I, I rarely use the word, but, and I maybe used it in class two or three times. Oh, awesome. Congratulations. Um, this actually uh, is, uh, I show this mainly because I'm so pleased to have found it. I discovered this photo only about a year or so ago when I ended up being involved in, in work on helping to get published the autobiography of that teacher of mine, Frank Keller. Uh, that's him back there. This is Nat Schoenfeld. And the funny thing is, this turned out to be in a collection of, uh, of uh, photographs. I had never seen it before, but I'm pretty sure that's me. In 19, <laughs> I guess that would have been. I think this would be the uh, uh, the spring of 1955. I shouldn't be talking about these numbers, but uh, but I, I just couldn't resist showing. Uh, the kinds of books that are around in the field are things like this. There's a textbook on animal discrimination learning. Actually, not not so much an, uh, an introductory textbook, but an advanced level book with all kinds of chapters on on uh, these sorts of things. Now. I think at this point, what I'd really like to do is to give you a little bit of a feeling for, uh, let me get a little bit more room here, uh, for the kinds of things we do in the laboratory. I've got to get in there enough to be able to hide this for a second. I would like to show you a film, and uh, um, a little film, because this is not very long, it's only about 90 seconds or so. Uh, but. 
once we had been uh, once we've been doing these sorts of things in the laboratory, um, it became a pretty straightforward thing to to try to use these in our courses. And uh, uh, in introducing me, Robert Deluti mentioned uh, my dear colleague Elliot Shimoff. He and I taught together for many many years, and one of the things that we always thought was so important was that when we were students, and he, by the way, was a, a, a PhD student at Columbia at a different time from me, and he had also had work with Schoenfeld. And we, we had been turned on to this field because when you really work with a live organism and you can see how you can change what it does by these various uh, simple kinds of procedures, you want to share that with students. And uh, unfortunately, because we had very large classes, there was no way to give students a lab experience. So we, we often had uh, animal uh, demonstrations. And uh, this clip here, which let me just uh, get this uh, up a bit. This shows uh, a chamber with a pigeon in it. Uh, back there is a little disc uh, upon which the pigeon uh, may peg when it lights up. Uh, we would bring this kind of a thing into the classroom. And uh, the way it would work is in the back, there is a feeder. You see me turning the chamber around and pointing to the feeder. There's food in that device there. And when the bird pecks, we can fix it so that that little tray comes up, as you see in this little clip. And also, at the same time, the light up there lights up. And the bird learns that when the light comes on, the tray comes up. So we have a way of delivering food when it does things. Okay, that's nothing very complicated about it. It's all kind of simple stuff. Uh, the, uh, uh, and then what we do is we can train the bird to do something. Now what I'm showing you here is a very simple classroom demonstration of a discrimination. The light's red, the pigeon turns, pecks, turns, pecks, <laughs> turns, pecks, and the last peck produces food. We have a very complicated technical name for that. We call it peck turn peck. <laughs> uh, now that's what the pigeon does in the presence of bread. Okay. Uh, a little bit more, a little bit of a closer look. Bird stops to glance at the camera occasionally. <laughs> but the key can be made different colors. Actually, those, uh, here, here the key is green. It's only, it's lit from behind by Christmas tree bulbs, by the way. Uh, and when the key is green, the pigeon has to peck the key 20 times, and the 20th peck produces food. And so in this particular case, we have a simple discrimination. The pigeon is discriminating between green and red. And by the way, that's why that's included in the title of this talk. Green, red, we'll get to the other dimensions a little bit later. Now it's red again. So the main point of a discrimination, it's, it's as, as simple as life could be. It's probably as fundamental as you can get. We are creatures who live in complicated worlds. Uh, some of the things that we do in those worlds depend upon uh, the stimuli that are around and what their consequences will be depend upon what we see, what we hear, what we touch. And we learn to do some things in the presence of some stimuli and other things in the presence of other stimuli. And these experiments are simply ways of studying that very basic kind of thing. Once we can teach discriminations, we can use them as tools. So for example, we know a great deal about how the human visual system works and how it differs from those of other organisms like pigeons and, and so forth. Pigeons do have, as you can tell, fairly good color vision. In fact, their color vision may be better than humans. Um, we can study the auditory system and study discriminations with respect to sounds and so forth. Um, just a little bit more, but I, I think you get the point. Uh, and this example uh, is mainly um, important here uh, because I also want to talk about cases in which, uh, and that's the end of it, that's the, that's the film clip. I'm gonna also want to talk about cases in which, uh, um, excuse me just a second while I get out of here and get back to the, uh, to the slideshow.
because we're going to have some other stuff. Uh, but remember that example I mentioned with the rat way back then was the rat learned to press when the light was on and nothing happened when the light was off. This example simply shows that you can do one thing in the presence of one stimulus, a different uh, thing in the presence of a different one. In fact, all of this demonstrates what we technically call the three-term contingency. In the presence of stimulus one, the first one, of response one, may produce consequence one. In the presence of stimulus two, response two may produce consequence two. In other words, behavior has different consequences in the presence of these stimuli. And when we see the pigeon behave differently, in the presence of those stimuli, we say that it discriminates the green from the red. Now, it's important at this point to say a few things about these words. Um, I, am, I used to walk into the, well, when I was a student, I'd walk into class and we'd talk about discrimination, and it was pretty clear that we meant it only in a technical sense. And then year after year, I taught the learning course, and at some point, especially as UMBC became more and more diverse in its student body, it began to occur to me that here I was walking into class and suddenly beginning to talk about discrimination and discrimination learning to a classroom of students, for many of whom the word really seems to be a very different kind of word because the everyday talk with respect to a word like discrimination is, well, we discriminate with respect to racial dimensions and ethnic dimensions. We discriminate across all sorts of lines. And here I am just waltzing in and talking about the pigeon discriminating green from red. How about black versus white? How about pink versus blue? How about all of the other dimensions that matter? And once I realized that, I began to think it was important to address it directly. Oh, and I, at the beginning, I would say casual things like, well, you know, the word discrimination also appears in our social talk, but after all, we want to discuss it in its technical significance. And then I mentioned we also sometimes talk about discrimination as being a good thing. You can have discriminating tastes, you know, you could be able to pick these things out. Um, and uh, actually, I must credit uh, Freeman Rabowski because I once had a conversation with him about those kinds of issues, plus some things in my personal history, which I'm going to mention in a moment. And he said, well, you really ought to talk about those kinds of things in class. So he gave me some of the encouragement that I started to do it um, with a little bit of trepidation because you can really upset people with some of the talking about some of these issues. And, and, uh, um, and so what I'm going to be doing now is to be telling you a little bit about what I've learned in trying to teach this material in the learning course and in trying to relate the very basic topic of discrimination as we treat it in the psychology of learning to discrimination as we see it in our culture. Um, and I, I can hardly think of a better time to do this, by the way, because uh, um, I, and I'm, I'm really pleased that I'm giving this talk a little bit before the election because there's so much of this that uh, is, is relevant to, to uh, these kind of bigger social issues. But I also have to provide a caution here. By discrimination, I mean behavior that uh, is discriminated with respect to some stimuli and that depends upon somebody having had different experiences in the presence of those stimuli. I don't mean the kinds of differential ways in which you might treat people. It's just based on things you've heard about them without ever having had, without ever having had experience. Okay, and so I am. I don't want to disappoint you, but you know, the, the, what I'm going to talk about is enough to, to cover a lot of time, and I cannot address today the difference between discrimination and prejudice, which is quite literally, think about it, it's pre-judgment. It's judgment about somebody before you've had the opportunity to interact. Okay? So you can prejudge somebody, or you can because of certain experiences you've had with people who have this characteristic and these things have happened when you've done things and people have this other characteristic and different things that have happened. You can discriminate based on the differential consequences. Sometimes that can be as inevitable as it is inevitable that the pigeon will behave differently in the presence of green than in the presence of red because you arrange different contingencies for what its responses do in the presence of those stimuli. So, there's an awful lot that we can say. Uh, uh, Robert, in his introduction, mentioned that one of my other areas of interest is in verbal behavior. 
And there is an awful lot that we can say about the way words make differences. And uh, there again, the current political scene is an issue as we worry about the kinds of things that people say um, in political campaigns, but just, uh, which, which do have prejudicial outcomes. But unfortunately, uh, I won't be able to spend very much time on, on that. I want to stick to the issue of discrimination learning. So what I'm going to do is uh, carry you through, uh, well, excuse me, actually, uh, um, what I'm going to do first is tell you a little bit about my background that enters into why uh, these kinds of things can be uh, of interest to us. And then I want to tell you a little bit about some basic behavioral procedures and then explore some of their implications. How we can take the stuff that we know about discrimination learning in nonverbal creatures like pigeons and rats and maybe have them help us in the way in which we think about issues of discrimination as they exist in human culture. See, I was a New York City kid. I uh, grew up in Upper Manhattan on 182nd Street. Uh, the, uh, the neighborhood I grew up in was, was at the intersection of lots of different ethnic neighborhoods. And so um, right on my street within the one or two buildings next to mine, we had a, uh, a building with about three apartments on each floor, and five stories tall. Um, one of my friends was Orman Cisneros, who was Hispanic. And then there was Jimmy Mayock, who was Irish. Uh, the next building over was John Seibart, who was Scandinavian. Uh, the people overhead, uh, I was, we were on a ground floor apartment with the Weisses, they were Jewish. Um, I, we, I didn't see their uh, son very much because uh, he went down the street to Yeshiva, with, and 182nd Street is the same street on which uh, Yeshiva University uh, uh, exists. And, and, uh, but, but the students who were coming from other parts of the city and going to Yeshiva would usually come up St. Nicholas Avenue and instead of walking down our block, they walked the other way. So we didn't see them very often. Probably there was a time that later, Elliot Chimov went to Yeshiva, so, but I don't think I was still living at, at home at that time. Uh, but it was pretty much racially homogeneous. Okay. Uh, uh, the, oh, there was a Greek family, but, it, but because it was at the intersection of these neighborhoods, so it was a multicultural place. My mother ended up, uh, 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 after leaving that area, she ended up living in an apartment in Queens for a long time. Uh, and there, hers was truly multi-ethnic, multi-racial. Uh, it was a place in Queens in which the, uh, they called it the United Nations because there were people in the building from just about every culture imaginable. And, uh, um, and it was always fun to, to, to visit her. So I had a little bit of uh, uh, experience there in, in multicultural stuff, which is very nice. I mean, that's certainly one of the, the great things about UMBC is all of the different cultures that are uh, represented here. Uh, I also had the opportunity to get summer jobs, and I happened to get summer jobs in the New York City hospital system. Uh, and the particular hospital that happened to have openings for uh, somebody who was going to be substituting uh, for ward attendants who were off on vacation was Harlem Hospital. So I spent several summers uh, commuting from Washington Heights uh, 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 down to 125th Street, changed trains, took the train up to 135th Street, walked across Harlem uh, three or four blocks. Um, in those days, um, there was no problem doing that, actually. And uh, I was essentially the only uh, white kid working there summers, and pretty much the only uh, white person who was uh, at the jobs that were at the level of ward attendant and so on. Uh, a lot of the doctors at that time were white. I suspect things are different in Harlem Hospital now. Now, one of the, the important things about that was I very quickly learned to discriminate among people within the group. Because as you'd expect in any place, uh, there would be uh, some people and you'd see them doing all sorts of things to get the job done. They didn't worry about when the, the, the clock uh, uh, came to the time in which it was time to leave. They'd go out of their way to be helpful. And then there were the other people who would work at the clerical jobs and would not do one stitch more than what their job description said they should do. There were some, clearly some people who welcomed me and helped me and taught me a lot. And there were 
including some others who kind of resented it that this white kid was working in the hospital. And I began to learn these kinds of things. But I, uh, I made a lot of friends there and uh, uh, talked to uh, 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 other attendants who I worked with. And so that, that history is, is part of my background. Um, then uh, came the time to start worrying about uh, going on to, to schools, and this was just to remind people about uh, what our history is. Um, when I was a, an undergraduate, and it came, or actually, uh, you know, when I was an undergraduate and it was time to apply to uh, graduate school, uh, there were concerns in those days that if you were Jewish, you shouldn't even bother trying to apply to Princeton. At the undergraduate level, uh, if, depending upon your ethnic background, to apply to the Ivy League schools was a bit of a concern. And so, uh, for example, I, as, as you've already heard, I was an undergraduate at Columbia, and I took my PhD at Harvard in the Department of Psychology. And the Department of Psychology had this great big wall in which there were a succession of plaques which showed all of the PhDs going back to the earliest days of the psychology department there. And my parents came up for a visit the first uh, fall that I was there as a graduate student, and I was showing them around the department, and my mother went down and looked at all of the plaques. And when she got to the end, she turned around to me and she said, Charlie, do you realize there's not a single Italian name in that list? And what her concern was, was that there was, I was gonna run into problems because um, uh, we weren't, uh, uh, didn't have the right kind of background because all these names were different kinds of names. Well, thank goodness the world is changing. Um, back in those days, uh, there were still people involved in civil rights marches. There were still all kinds of things going on. Earlier times, uh, if you were Irish or uh, Italian or from the Baltic states, during World War I, military units in the United States Army that went over to fight in Europe during World War I was segregated into uh, ethnic groups. That is, there was one, there were these units that were Irish units and these units that were uh, Italian and so forth. And on the IQ tests that were being given in those days, uh, they actually ranked people by intelligence and so forth. And many of the, the European uh, Mediterranean groups were ranked lower than, uh, uh, than African Americans in that list. Uh, now, of course, we know about all kinds of prejudices and, and actually, I should say, discriminations as well. So we have a history which makes, which makes the current days really marvelous um, because, uh, uh, and, and I say, we've mentioned the, the, the blue-red, uh, we have come an enormous way, and it's all been within some of our lifetimes to have seen all of these kinds of things change. And I just, just in passing along these lines, I just want to say that being at UMBC has been really uh, uh, important to me along those uh, lines because we have had such a diverse group of students. Robert mentioned in the introduction the, the international connections of people from Brazil and Norway and, and, and other places. And uh, I can also mention uh, the many students, a uh, uh, student from India who was once a TA and so forth. And so uh, anyway, you're, you're a great group. And, and, and it's great to see that we're seeing more diversity at the level of uh, uh, the national situation as well. But I'll come back to that a little bit later. OK, with all of that then, how that gives me a little bit to say about discrimination and about some of these issues, uh, and maybe to try to relate it to these basic processes that I've talked about. But how do we get from the one place to another? Well, let's, let's get back for a little while to talking about the animal behavior literature in just a few minutes. I'm going to give you a couple of basics. Uh, and then I'm going to come back to talking about the social implications. First of all, when we talk about discrimination learning, it's so easy to just emphasize the stimuli. You know, it's the colors on the key, you might want to find out something about that. But what's really important is to emphasize that it's doing something. The pigeon who is learning to peck green but not red or to do something different has to be looking at the stimuli, it has to be doing something. The important words of verbs, looking, attending, listening, and so forth. It's not just that we're passive receptors of the things that go on in the world. So, Here's a, 
uh, an example of a simple experiment that we can do. Imagine instead of the colors red and green, that the stimuli that come up on that little disk are either an array of squares with a star somewhere in it, or simply an array of squares with no star. If those are the two alternatives, we can fix it so that if there's a star there and the bird pecks, the bird gets food. If there's no star there and the bird pecks, the bird doesn't get food. And just to make sure that the bird is paying attention, we move things around. And so the star moves from one place to another. So we call this feature positive because that distinctive feature, the star, that's different from all the other things, is the predictor of whether the bird's peck is going to produce food. Pigeons learn this really, really rapidly. It's an easy thing for them to do. They pick it up real fast. And if you watch what they're doing, actually, when the stimulus comes up, when the positive stimulus comes up and has a star in it, they actually peck at the star wherever it is in the array. Okay? Really easy. But you can also set it up so the distinctive feature is negative. This is exactly the same kind of discrimination, you might think. The difference is the star is now the signal that the pecks will do nothing. Only if it's all squares will the pigeon get food, if it pecks the key. So this pit, and let's suppose we start this experiment with a new pigeon. This new pigeon, when the 16 squares come up, pecks the key, it'll get food. When the squares come up with a star on it, it will not get food. And of course, we present these trials over and over again, and the star appears in different places. And uh, if we establish that discrimination, the thing is it takes a long, long time. And if you look at what the pigeon is doing, when the array with the star comes up, the pigeon tends to move away from it. And if it's not looking at the star, it's looking at the squares. And those are a lot like the squares when they come up without a star. And it takes a long time for the pigeon to learn it. Now, what this tells us is that in a discrimination, a stimulus that's correlated with a payoff, like food, becomes something worth looking at. But if the stimulus is correlated with nothing happening, or even worse, maybe an aversive event, then you tend not to look at it. This is incredibly important for us, too, because we often tend to look at things in which what we see agrees with things we already believe or things we already know. Let me ask you, this, this is an easy one because you can answer this one without having to reveal your political preferences, okay? And I know it's probably the wrong audience because a lot of the people in this audience probably get a lot of their news uh, online rather than watching TV. But either you're a Republican, but you spend most of your time getting your news on TV from MSNBC, or you're a Democrat, and you spend most of your time getting your news on Fox. So you see, you can answer this one. You can answer this one whatever, without betraying your political preferences, right? So how many people here are either Democrats who spend, get their news from Fox, or Republicans who get their news from MSNBC? Is there anybody? That, I, I, I'm arguing that that difference is a bit like the pigeon Paying attention to the star if the star is correlated with food, but not paying attention to the star in, the, in an experiment in which the star is correlated with nothing. Okay? So we can create a discrimination. And one of the things that happens is that when we do so, we can, on the basis of various features, get, have, we, have, we have to worry also about what the pigeon is doing, what it's paying attention to. We could do experiments in which uh, we use colors and shapes and other things and get it to pay attention just to the color. And, you know, if you were dealing with people and the only thing you were paying attention to was the color of their skin and you weren't paying attention to anything else, you could say of the people whose skin happened to be of that color, they all look alike to me. It's a problem of attention. Um, on the other hand, if you're dealing with a lot of different people who are, all have skin of a certain color, and some of them behave one way, and your interactions with them are different from the interactions with others, you're going to learn the things that are different about these people. You're going to treat them as individuals. You're going to deal with them in different kinds of ways. So the problem of attention goes all the way from something that you can talk about with respect to pigeons and rats 
to something you can talk about when you're asking about pe how people interact with each other. Now, you can, and this was a technical term, I didn't point it out when I showed you that chapter heading, you can try to abolish a discrimination. You can try to get rid of it. Okay, segregation is a bad thing. Let's just no longer pay any attention to whatever dimensions of people uh, uh, create that sort of thing. Let's try to abolish it. Uh, this would be trying to arrange things, for example, where whether there's a store there or not, the pigeons pecks always produce food. And you could wait and see how long it might take. Actually, it might take a while before the, the pigeon would probably still respond differently to these, uh, uh, these stimuli for a long while. Or you could do the opposite. You could abolish it by making sure that in the presence of neither of these stimuli does the pigeon's response produce food. You could also try to reverse a discrimination. Okay? If you started with uh, if you started with a bird who'd been trained so that pets produce food given the star, but not with no star, you could switch it around. And in fact, that's what the feature negative did. The star used to be, uh, if, if you were doing this with a single bird, and you started out first teaching this one, doing the switch to this one would be a reversal. You could argue that if you suddenly tried to reverse what you saw as segregation in schools, that you might want to change it around and actually go further in the other direction. And some people might say that's what affirmative action could, uh, could be. And the thing about it is, although it may do important things and sometimes very good things, it is also maintaining attention to that particular dimension of stimuli out there in the world. So these are the kinds of things that issues that are raised by thinking about these things in this way. Finally, one more thing, and I'm going to come back to it later. We can also create conditional discriminations. Um, so for example, we could try to train the bird so that when the arrays came up, so that it was one or the other of these, but the background was green, that when it was green, you've got to peck the star. But if the background comes up, background color comes up in red, then you've got to peck the the uniform grid to get food, and if you peck the one with a star in it, you'll get nothing. This is conditional in the sense that whether the star is a reinforcement stimulus or not depends upon what the background color is. And I'm glad we finally did get those colors worked out at the beginning. Okay, so let's let's pause a little now. Let me tell you a little bit about how I sort of segued into covering this in the classroom. Um, Once I uh, had reached the point of wanting to talk about this a, a bit, uh, I started with uh, an example. Okay. Supposing you have these two gangs. They're called the Sharks and the Jets. Does that sound familiar? Anybody <laughs> ever heard of the Sharks and the Jets? Uh, they are in adjacent neighborhoods. And of course, as you'd expect, the Sharks talk different from the Jets. They look a little different, they certainly dress differently. Now supposing you're a shark, and you're walking down the street, and up the end of the street are, are another bunch of guys, actually I say that, if you know the West Side Story, actually one of, in, in, among the Jets there was a gal who, who sort of, but you know, let me, let me make it simple for a moment. Um, now, you walk down the street, but the guys at the other end of the street are from one gang or the other. If if they are sharks, and you're a shark, and you walk up that street, and you end up getting close to them, things are going to be fine. You're going to start horsing around. You're going to do things. You're going to dance, you know, whatever you do. <laughs> um, if they're jets, however, and you do that, you're likely to be in big trouble. They're certainly going to pick at you. They may start hassling you in various ways. Now, imagine that you have not been around these streets very long. This is a case in which you've got two sets of stimuli. You've got the ways that the sharks, the members of your own gang, look, and the ways that the, the jets, the members of the other gang, look. And you've got your behavior with respect to them. You walk toward them or you walk away from them. If you walk toward the one, the consequences for your behavior are going to be very different than if you walk toward the other. That's exactly the set of arrangements that exists with respect to the pigeons pecking red or green in the simple first example I gave you. 
What's going to happen to the pigeon's behavior given those contingencies is inevitable, assuming that the pigeon's capable of seeing these differences in colors at all. It is going to behave differently in the presence of green or red. But will not that also happen with respect to the sharks and with respect to the jets? The consequences are going to be different. And they will inevitably discriminate. Now, if you're following me that far, then the question is, what are the implications of that? How many people have, in one situ situation or another, found that they've ended up uh, behaving with respect to other people who have special characteristics and therefore have had different things happen to them as a result of where they went, what they did? If you are uh, a member of one ethnic group and you go into uh, certain streets in particular neighborhoods that are occupied by other ethnic groups and you can't tell the difference, you may be in big trouble. Can you fail to learn? If you're, uh, uh, we can come up with examples all over the world. I mean, we could pick up examples like uh, uh, the, uh, the black athlete who is gonna be jogging in an all white neighborhood and finds when he does that, that the police are likely to pull him over and give him a hard time but not if he jogs in neighborhoods which have more people in that neighborhood that are like him. Uh, will he not learn after a while that this is something in which you have to respond differently given these different kinds of circumstances? You see, the problem with this is if differential contingencies that operate in the presence of different stimuli will exert their effects because that's the way behavior works, that's really different from saying, well, okay, let's just forget about it all. We now have to treat all people the same. We must no longer uh, treat them differently uh, because we shouldn't be doing that. But you know, it may remain the case that there are going to be problems somewhere where if you don't discriminate along those dimensions, you can get in big trouble. And so the challenge is how do we deal with that? What do we say about that? Well, I, I would start out in class. Remember, this is how I sort of worked into talking about this in class. I, the, the early things I did were to, uh, to start asking students about whether they had been discriminated against in various ways. And we can start going around the room here. Is, is there anybody in this room who has never felt discrimination in some way or other, in some situation, never been discriminated against? Kind of interesting, not a single hand. I, I've always been found this really, really interesting because in the class, if I went around and started asking people, I've always been startled by some of the dimensions that people would say. Because sometimes I expected that they would be the obvious dimensions. You think that certainly racial discrimination would be an issue. Um, uh, uh, a woman in one class who was tall, and because she was tall, that was. Uh, a guy once who said, well, my friends know I'm athletic, and I'm, I'm, I'm a jock. I mean, uh, this is somebody who, who played, I, I'm, unfortunately, I don't remember which team he was on. But he said, because I'm a jock, they think I'm stupid. You know, I, so that was his. Um, I found age was surprisingly often the kinds of things that the younger students in the class would talk about, and being treated uh, differently if they went into a restaurant or something, not being served right away, and, and so forth. Um, and so the, the, the first thing was, yes, all of us have been exposed to that. And that was one of the reasons for talking about early environments and, all, and how, how much existed with respect to prejudices uh, or discriminations in, in, uh, in, say, an educational system at the time. You had to really worry about whether you had any chance of getting into a school that you wanted to apply, uh, apply for. And that was okay for a while, and it got conversation going, and people listened to that kind of stuff, and, and it did get us to talk more effectively about some of these other kinds of issues. But it bothered me, because that wasn't the real question. This was a question about the victims. Have you been a victim of discrimination? Have you been a victim of discrimination? Has somebody treated you badly? But we're talking about the behavior of those who do the discriminating. So the next question, and this is a tougher one, have you ever behaved discriminatively towards somebody else? And then the class quiets down. Hardly anybody says anything. But you know, it happens all the time. 
does every woman treat every guy she meets in the same way that she treats other women? Does every guy treat every woman he meets in the same way he treats other guys? Um, there are all sorts of ways in which we respond differently to other people. And so if you start, and, and then what about the, the, the cases where somebody really has had an experience? There was, a, there was a, an article, and unfortunately I was not able to locate it, but the, uh, a little piece in uh, the New York Times uh, some years ago. I know I have it somewhere, but I've been moving my stuff around a, a, a lot. Um, it was a description of a woman who um, lived in a, in a particular neighborhood uh, that was uh, just, just was not homogeneous, but just a little bit of mi racial mixture. And uh, a guy came to the door who was uh, apparently a well-dressed African-American, but it did turn out that he was, uh, 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 I, I don't remember the details, but he tried to get into the house. And, he, he, and I think she ended up calling the police and he left. And the thing, that, the thing about this article that's so special is that she then said that she knew that from then on, there might be some guy who also had some of the same physical characteristics of this one, who is also African American, who was just a guy coming around doing surveys, or was just a guy coming around as a neighbor or for whatever, but that she would still respond and worry about it. And she felt terribly guilty about it. And that is a problem. If, uh, if any of you have ever had a problem where you were involved with somebody of some other ethnic group, some other uh, uh, racial group, some other religious group, you, you name it, it, some of those effects will linger as inevitably as the effects of the differential contingencies for pigeon pecking keys or rats pressing levers. And the question is, what do you do about those kinds of things? So um, let's see. How we by the way, how am I? How do I stand on time? About another ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Then we'll leave some time for questions. Okay, that's fine. So, um, so what what do you do about these kinds of things? Um, well, this is where uh, you can try to abolish discriminations. You can try to uh, eliminate them, but that, those often lead to other kinds of problems. Uh, Oh, I just I just realized actually that I did I didn't do some other kinds of things with respect to to, to the discrimination procedures that I meant to talk about. Uh, I, I guess maybe at this point it's not even it's not even appropriate. I'll be backtracking a little bit. Okay, let's now let me uh, remind you again about the conditional discriminations. Okay, we could talk about trying to reverse discriminations by doing things like arranging for affirmative action. We could try to exhort people to just behave differently. Uh, and remember, this is again about the origins. If you look at the literature of social psychology uh, with respect to things like uh, uh, racial issues and so forth, what you often find in that literature is a description of the after effects of discrimination. So if you look at that literature, you'll find that uh, if somebody uh, shows a white audience, an audience of white subjects, uh, white men, for example, who are looking at a screen, pictures of people, and some of them are racially different, and some of them are, are black, and that, in fact, you can measure changes in their skin, uh, in the, the, the galvanic skin response, or other kinds of responses that they make. And, and, and you could even interview them and either they won't say anything about it. I don't know whether that's a variation of the Baldwin effect, but, um, or, uh, uh, or they won't, they, they simply won't report that they notice anything, or they say, well, you know, I'm not prejudiced and so forth, and yet you do these kinds of studies, and you see that there's this response that's there, which is a product of real histories, presumably real interactions, or else it has something to do with that other dimension, the prejudice, which is based on how other people talk. Um, so we have a huge literature about the outcomes, but we have very little to say, I would argue, in the field of psychology about the origins and the ways in which uh, um, these kinds of things might get started and the way in which they may proliferate. So anybody have any suggestions what we do about it?
if these things are real, we definitely want to be able to do something about it. Well, I think we do something about it here. Remember the conditional discrimination. You can learn a discrimination in one setting. I would not want to suggest to somebody who has to travel through uh, some troubled uh, inner city neighborhood that they should ignore the other people around on the street. Certainly you have all kinds of important distinctions that you have to learn how to make. Um, you also have to learn about the people who you could uh, associate with who are going to be encouraging you to go to school and to get things done and who are going to be helpful to you and the others who are mainly there to try to send you drugs. I mean, there's all kinds of things where it's important to discriminate on the basis of all sorts of dimensions. But what happens if you happen to come to UMBC? What discriminations matter then? Remember, the pigeon can learn to peck the stimulus with the star in it when the background is green and the stimulus without the star in it when the background is red. Okay? One of the things that we do, and I think, I think uh, this makes America, the American educational system so crucially important, is that here we teach the conditional discrimination. So when I have a student in my class uh, who turns out to get the highest grade on all the quizzes, that happened a few semesters back with a student who was a Muslim, okay? best grade in the class, came up to ask questions, it would have been irrelevant for me to be responding to him. In fact, the most interesting response that I could make is to not to what the student looked like, not to what the student, not to what the student's ethnic background is. And by the way, that's that's discriminative often if it means that you can often tell something about a student by what they wear. A student who's wearing a yarmulke is pretty likely to be Jewish. A uh, woman who's wearing a burqa is pretty likely to be Muslim. You can tell lots of things by people according to all sorts of dimensions. Uh, but as an academic and in the university, those dimensions should no longer be relevant. The dimensions that matter are the dimensions that have to do with the student's performance in the classroom. And for those who do very well there, the rest of it doesn't matter at all. And so, one of the things I see that's hopeful is that uh, since the day, yeah, there were the accidental, uh, fortunate uh, situations in which people could grow up in some multi-ethnic neighborhoods, even though most of the areas around were very homogeneous uh, uh, ethnic neighborhoods. But we now have places like uh, Columbia, Maryland, which is a community which was deliberately set up to avoid some of the uh, segregated housing and all those kinds of things. And we have universities, and the whole point of a university is that we do not discriminate along those dimensions, we discriminate along other dimensions. So I see that at least we have the possibility of these little enclaves, these places in our culture, in American culture these days, and hey, maybe the way things are going, it's gonna become more prominent even at the level of uh, the, the, the government. We're seeing some of that going. Uh, so we can be hopeful. Um, I, I, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm going to vote for Obama. I hope everybody. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and especially, and especially uh, because of his intellectual curiosity and intellectual rigor, I mean, he seems a lot more like one of us. And uh, um, and okay, so we're an elite. I'm I'm okay with that with that uh, uh, with that too. And I got to remind you, he's not only black; he's white too. He combines all of these dimensions. Good thing. Um, so what I want to do then is, is close with this hopeful message that, in fact, we do have a, a phenomenon there that we can address in terms of these basic learning processes. They are real, and so we can't just say, this is all social stuff, and, and we can just sort of teach it away, that we have to teach different kinds of discriminations. After all, you could attend to one thing or another thing about people, and what universities should do is attend to the competence, the, the academic excellence, 
uh, the productivity and all of these kinds of dimensions. And once you start paying attention to one dimension, it often means that you stop worrying about the other dimensions, which is really what it's all about. And I think we're getting better, and I'm feeling more and more hopeful all the time. So I think, I think I'll stop at that point. And, and we'll have to On that very hopeful note, uh, let's open up the floor for questions for Dr. Catania. Well, that means it was all very clear. <laughs> you can ask me about the things I left out. <laughs> Since we do, well, are there any hands? Yes, please. Um, I was wondering if there were, if there have been, and I'm sure there have, but what uh, experiments have been done with people to change their views, you know, their, maybe what you said with uh, sensing discriminatory views, that they could change that? I, I don't know of any literature that's concerned with seeing how those kinds of responses change with history, so it would be worth doing, I suppose, but, but you have to be worrying about changing the histories first, and, and that's, that's tough to do in an experimental way. You sort of have to look for the natural experiments, I suppose. Um, the, uh, uh, if I would also be interested in whether the kinds of different ways in which people react toward others that are brought about not by actual experience, but are brought about mainly through other people's talk, would show different kinds of results, and whether some are more inflexible than others. You almost get the impression that the ones that are uh, that involved entrenched talk are harder to, to move. And I, I sometimes lately have been thinking that, uh, uh, if you, you know the old song out of South Pacific, you've got to be carefully taught, you, know, you, got to be, you, hate all the, you hate all the people your relatives hate. You know, that, you know. um, and, and that might be harder to move, but it might be harder to move simply because it tends to start early and it tends to stay around for a long time. But with regard to experiences, it, it's interesting that with the stuff that's going on in politics right now, it's in some of the places that tend to be sort of geographically isolated, where people don't have a lot of experience with people of a lot of different backgrounds and, and uh, 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 racial backgrounds and ethnic backgrounds, that, that some of the talk that seems to be the most prejudicial seems to be the strongest. And when you look at the places where there are the most chances for people to really interact with each other, <coughs> that that's less the case. But then as you start looking around the world, you see how difficult these problems are. I mean, if you're uh, 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 in, uh, in certain places in Iraq, you darn well better be able to tell whether this person up the road is a Shiite or a Sunni. Um, if you're in some places in the Middle East, uh, uh, you know, you've got uh, uh, Hezbollah, and you've got uh, uh, Jews, and you've got Palestinians, and you've got people, all of whom are very different, and there are times when it's really important to tell the difference. If you Look at the uh, 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 Tutsis, the Hutus, or if you look at—I mean, every in, in, the, in the in the Far East, you've got problems with the Japanese and the Koreans and the Chinese. Everywhere you go in the world, you run into things that involve people behaving differently toward others, and in all, it, I mean, it would seem to me that if you were in Afghanistan, you sure as hell want to know whether the street you're on is filled with Taliban or filled with different kinds of uh, Afghanis. So once you've got those kinds of systems in place, it is inevitable that you will look differently and, and in fact be forced to make these kinds of discriminations. So uh, I, I can't, and, and we are, un well, not unique, but we are a culture in which that's changing. Parts of Europe are, Somewhat different, although there are, there are some ethnic issues in Europe that are really massively difficult. Muslims who have uh, immigrated into some countries in Europe, France has all kinds of problems. And, uh, so uh, part of it has to be to uh, 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 create special kinds of communities, places where people can start to learn. And, and that's why things like the Fulbright program, which I'm privileged to try to mention, able to participate in are so important. And one of the things that's happened in the past eight years of, uh, or almost eight years of the current administration is 
cutting down all sorts of things that involve people getting to know each other, bringing in people from other countries, sending our students out to other countries so that they could learn about that. You folks might want to look at the possibility of those sorts of things. They're marvelous experiences, but they also contribute to breaking down the other kinds of discriminations which are so destructive and replacing them with other more constructive ones. Um, are there any other questions? Because I have one for Dr. Kennedy, but I wouldn't want to come before one of you. A quick one. Um, so I'm very moved by the image of universities like UMBC being true meritocracies. But in a meritocracy, the metrics matter, and we've learned a lot about the cultural biases of standardized testing, SAT being a common one. So I was curious, in your own class, as you were incorporating this into your content, how did you change the way in which you evaluate the students? Oh, <laughs> I didn't do much there because these were big classes. These were classes with uh, large numbers of students, and almost all of my exams were objective questions. I would have loved to, have, uh, I, the only times in which it's been a bit different is that I had the privilege last, uh, during my last year, um, to be uh, teaching one uh, small honor section. And there we did a lot of talking, and there you don't have to worry about that because when you're talking with students and you have eight of them around the table or something like that, you get to know whether they read the stuff or not, and that's easy. Um, so, um, so I, but that would get me into a whole discussion of, of education uh, and uh, the kinds of things that come out of the, the, uh, the kinds of uh, uh, behavior analysis that I'm involved in and would take us pretty far afield. Um, but I'm there too. I think that education is crucial. What is H.G. Wells, I guess, said? Uh, the history of the world is the race between education and catastrophe. And uh, gee, look at our political system. It's the difference between people who are in intellectual curiosity and those who seem not to. Um, and the sooner we can get more people educated, I think, the sooner we can. And, and the criteria, they're going to be all kinds of things, but, but a lot of it is going to be what they can end up being able to do. Um, I, I, and you said I'm dead, so that quickly, yeah. <laughs> With the audience's permission, I will ask the last question. Uh, Charlie, I was wondering, with regard to your classes, when you ask about uh, examples of discrimination, if any students talked about uh, discrimination against uh, being a political conservative. And the reason I ask that is, uh, in a number of the comments you've made here, you've said, uh, I like Obama because of his intellectual curiosity. He's like us. OK, well, I, 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 was, I was thinking of a particular, uh, uh, particular candidate who was conservative, who didn't seem to have much intellectual so, um, I, yeah, I guess that's, uh, and <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, and I must say, by the way, I was delighted by Colin Powell's remarks about uh, the, the kinds of, well, oh. <laughs> but, but, but if I, a follow-up, if I may, uh, have sure. students spoken about uh, how they feel discriminated for being a political conservative yeah, okay. on campus of the South? Well, you know, I, I when I was, uh, 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 at the time that I was uh, a student, um, Republicans were very different. Uh, the, the, the political kinds of conservatism that was rec represented by the Republicanism of somebody like Thomas E. Dewey, who was the one who uh, uh, ran against Harry Truman after World War II, was a very different kind of conservative. Uh, 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 my uh, my father-in-law was a conservative Republican, but a very different kind of Republican. I think he would have been upset by many of the things that are happening in the campaigning these days, which are so often addressed at uh, um, not at uh, discussing issues, but as personal invective and so forth. Uh, uh, so I would be happy to talk to conservatives who have, well, who, have, who, who's, who, who come out of that kind of distinguished tradition. In fact, I was, I was very lucky as a graduate student. Remember, I went from Columbia to Harvard. I think that's a good, good transition. Um, and, uh, and so I, I sort of can say, hey, I, uh, I'd like to see a presidential candidate who, who follows that kind of group. 
Uh, but, uh, but I was also very lucky in that when I was a graduate student, I was sharing a, a place with, uh, 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 and as a graduate student with another student, one of the, originally with a psychologist who then got a job and left, and the person who moved into his place was in fact John Dewey, who happened to be Tom Dewey's son. And so I in fact talked with him a lot and learned a lot about his father's perspective on the Republican. And that was a world of difference. After all, Theodore Roosevelt was gave us conservation and all of those kinds of things. Those traditions are not bad traditions. What, is, what, what I worry about are the practices in which saying certain kinds of things about people that, uh, which, are, which create divisions uh, are probably a bit. Part of discrimination is, yeah, you've got a difference between this stuff and that stuff. So I, I would welcome that kind of question. Thank you, Charlie. And thank you all.